Good morning, guys. Uh, welcome back. Happy Sunday. Hopefully you're having a, uh, a good morning and thanks for tuning in. Um, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day to be alive uh, in this beautiful month of May. Um, we pray, God, as we get into your word, uh, your living word, which is sharper than a double-edged sword cutting through sinew and flesh and getting right into our souls, able to discern our thoughts, our motives. Oh, Lord, that we would be refined and encouraged, God, that uh, you as the heavenly doctor, the great physician, would um, heal us and restore us so that we would be able to go forth, God, in strength to overcome, to be upright, Lord. We thank you, God, and we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, well, we'll go ahead and start with uh, <clears throat> some songs. Um, first one is going to be called Jesus is a Rock, probably something you might have sang when you were a kid, but I don't know, it just really fit with the, uh, uh, the message today. So we're going to start with that and another song called uh, Jesus Lead On. So um, hopefully you can join in.
this song So let's go ahead and open up our Bibles and get into the word I've entitled the sermon, uh, the word this morning, uh, The Purpose Driven Life. Uh, I know there's a book out there called the same name, but uh, this sermon, I, I didn't read the book, heard great things about it, but this sermon is not like just a regurgitation of that. Um, just, yeah, an FYI, but uh, the main scripture is Acts twenty. Uh, 24. This verse actually rocked me this week, um, really challenged me, really loved the verse. So I um, just want to share it with you, and it's what inspired uh, the, the word this week. So here we go. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. And my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Man, like, um, yeah, it's a Bible verse, but you know what's crazy is that someone actually said this. Someone lived their life, and this is how they thought and lived. And that just kind of really, really, yeah, it, 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 uh, it hit me hard. Like, can I, can I think like that? Can I live like that in every moment of my life? Just my worth is nothing. My life is worth nothing. Nothing. I don't care literally about anything. Everything else is loss. I count it all as loss. I only have one goal, and that is to finish this race um, and and do do the task, finish to get the goal, which is uh, spreading the good news of the gospel. And um, yeah, so what what is an, what an amazing word. Um, so here we go. I want to start with this. I want to kind of frame the word around a couple of questions. So the first question is this, why is purpose important and what is our purpose? What does the Bible say? Um, so here we go. First point I want to make, I want to make, ah, I'm talking, can't talk. Life, number one, life shouldn't be a meaningless wandering around. God has a plan and a purpose for you. Um, I want to share with you a few verses uh, with each point that I make. So the first verse is uh, 1 Peter 2.9. Um, and yeah, these will be below. Uh, 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's uh, special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Uh, Acts 20, 24, I'm going to read it to us again. And this time in the context of what is our purpose? Why is it important? Here we go. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. 
My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Um, so we're not cosmic accidents meandering about, um, not, uh, we, we in a, you know, our lives are not pointless. They, they are quite the opposite. God not only saves us, but he has a purpose for us. Isn't that amazing? It's like God not only buys you a car, but he has a destination for you too, and the means to get there. Um, point number two, our purpose as declared by God is to love God and to love others. Um, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 through 39 reminds us of this. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those uh, who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Um, so the first one just reminds us of the greatest uh, commandments that God just kind of summarizes into two, um, he says, to love God and to love people. And the gospel is truly central to this. Um, we, we, the gospel is all about us being redeemed from our rebellion um, by the blood of Jesus and being reconciled uh, to God so that we may know him and love him and enjoy him and glorify him and belong to him. Um, and what more better gift can we give someone than the truth and this faith-based access to eternal life. I, there's nothing greater than I can give you than this. Um, that is the greatest thing that we can do. And so our purpose is, is summarizing those two commandments, to, to know and love God and to help others know and love God. Um, and I added Romans 8.28. Um, I know the first part of that is very popular. I love it. It's wonderful. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. But I believe that that is secondary to the second half of that verse, which says, who have been called according to his purpose. So in order for us to understand what good means, we have to understand what God's purpose is. So when we just take out good out of the context of that verse, we can turn it into a health and wealth gospel. But when we put that back into the context of God's purpose, which we know is to redeem the lost, to, 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 to go leave the 99 and find the one sheep and celebrate in heaven forever, that is his purpose. And, and, and all of his wonderful attributes glorified and magnified in, in us understanding this um, that, that is God's purpose. I mean, that's the, that's the love story of the Bible. That is the heart of the message. And what God means by in all things, God works for the good of those who call. That, that's what God's doing. He's orchestrating this grand redemption through the generations. And our job is to be a part of that with our each individual strengths and weaknesses. And so that, that's what I wanted to clarify about Romans 8.28. The third point is the way that this great purpose is carried out is different in every individual. Um, Psalms 139, 15 through 16 says this, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God made us unique and he's established a different path for all of us. It says that our days were written in a book. God has already decided, you know, he knows um, how we'll be, who we'll be and how he will use us. Things that we can't, even, we can't even comprehend. Like, oh, then, you know, there's a lot of stuff that pops up into those, you know, you smart kids minds. Oh, like, okay, so everything was written out. So am I just a robot? No. <laughs> No, like God gives you free will, but he's so powerful that he's able to do that. And he's able to know all things and, and, and be over all things. Um, you know, <laughs> that thing, just something maybe one day we'll have the capacity to understand the miracle of God's wisdom and his, in his providence and his, uh, omnipotence. Um, but right now that's what I know. God has, he knows all our days and, um, 
I know that Psalm 139 kind of now sounds like a Hallmark card. You, you know, God knows me and, and he loves me and he uses me. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I personally take great comfort, though, in knowing that in all my imperfections, despite the fact that um, I've, I've never quite fit in to society standards, whether in high school or college or even now, despite all my failures and weaknesses um, and proneness to uh, to just messing up and getting lost. God says, you know what, Sam, I've called you and I'm going to use you um, despite all of that because of who I am, what I'm capable of. And I just take a lot of comfort in that. And I hope you do too. Um, point number four, our job then is to trust God and walk in his spirit, knowing that he'll guide us. And the verse I wanted to share is Acts 1.8. And this is what it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness, witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, isn't that crazy? Like God, this is back Acts 1. So this is when Jesus is uh, about to ascend into heaven after his resurrection. And he... Uh, informs the he instructs the the disciples hey don't go anywhere until you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit because that uh, that gift the Holy Spirit is who will be with you guide you direct you counsel you instruct you um, all of those things empower you um, and work through you um, so the Holy Spirit is absolutely integral to to who we are in our purpose and our mission. Um, and I want to add that one of the defining attributes of Christianity is actually selflessness. And here's where I get that this point, that there's nothing more contradictory to the gospel than pride and selfishness, because there's a lot of health and wealth gospels out there that um, the, the preachers, the false preachers are always just talking about uh, my comfort, my success, my future, my security, my how much I'm loved, how much I need to be the center of attention. Every word is about me, me, me. And when you think about it, the gospel is quite the opposite. Yes, you are loved and God sent his only son to die for you and to give you new life. And then from there on out, he says, go. It's about others. Go bring home the other lost. Go make disciples of all nations. I will be with you. I didn't just pour into you so that you would just keep it, but it would continue to flow out. And the, the best example is that we have is the one we have in Jesus. He, you know, he stepped off of his heavenly throne and came to earth. And we know how, what kind of life that he lived. So now that we've established the main points of the, the answer to the question of why is purpose important? What is our purpose according to the Bible? Um, I wanted to take a look into um, Paul's life. Um, he's the uh, author of that verse that uh, we're our main, uh, Acts 20, 24. Um, and this is to gain a biblical understanding of how purpose works in a believer's life on kind of like a firsthand example. And um, what better example do we have besides Jesus than the Apostle Paul? He, uh, amazing man. Um, as we've been studying the book of Acts, I've been just tremendously blessed by it. And I hope you are too. Um, and uh, this is when Paul is... Um, he's coming out of uh, kind of Eastern Europe, Asia, and he's and he's making his way back to Jerusalem. Um, and he's actually, it's, the Bible says that he's hoping to make it in time for to celebrate the Pentecost. We also know that he was um, he had a lot of money that was donated from the churches that he was collecting so that he can go and, and give it to the the widows and the needy that were uh, in Jerusalem so to help them out. Um, and we also know that, that Paul had an ultimate desire to go to Rome. Um, and what that reflects to me, at least, is that Paul was quite ambitious for the gospel. Like he wanted to go to the highest authority with the most um, influence, the most power. And he wanted to have that individual as his audience for the gospel. I mean, what, what a great ambition. Um, and another learning point, you know, is your ambition God-centered or is that your ambition um, you centered? Is it so that you can receive glory and, and all that good stuff? Or is your ambition for the gospel? Um, and even so, we, we also learned that Paul was compelled by the Spirit. Because that's another big thing. I, I know that questions pop up in your mind like, okay, what, God, what does God want for my life? What, where is he leading me? Like, uh, what am I supposed to do with it? Like, w am I supposed to be a doctor? Am I supposed to be a firefighter? 
Um, and so the answer is this, so the spirit compels. And we'll kind of, that's why I wanted to give us a real life example. So here we go. Um, so point number one, Paul's journey, his life is decided by his purpose and goal. Here's a couple of verses, Acts 22, 21. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Uh, this is when Paul was sharing his testimony to, um, I believe it was the Sanhedrin. It, no, it was a, the crowds that were arresting him. And he was explaining how he was called. But the point here is that uh, of what God said to Paul. And he's saying, God told me that because I used to uh, persecute and kill and uh, imprison uh, Jewish Christians, God's actually using me for a special mission out to the Gentiles. And that's based on God's wisdom. And that was part of God's plan, of course. Um, so his purpose and goal, God determined that he said, no, you buddy, you're going to be effective to the Gentiles. That's how I've designed you. So great. That's, his, um, that's, that's what dictates his journey. Acts 19, 21. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I had been there, Paul, he said, I must visit Rome also. So here we see that in this latter stage of his life, um, he's he made up his mind. He's like, number one, I got to go to Jerusalem um, and then I want to go to Rome. Uh, point number two, Paul's purpose and his goal was compelled by the spirit. So here we go into that point. Acts 20, 22. And now compelled by the spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Um, so here's, here's this thing, like, how do I know what God wants me to do? How do I know if he wants me to be you know, an engineer or go to UW or is it okay if I drop out? Like, how do I know? Well, that's, the, that's why I want to bring up the word compelled by the spirit. I believe that if you're spending enough time in the word and in prayer and, and in humble obedience to God and you have that closeness to God, then you will know when God is compelling you to do something or go a certain direction. Just like if you spend enough time with a person, you can tell when they want to compel you to do something. Point is when you are uh, close in the spirit, studying, doing all that stuff, you will know because God speaks to you. It's when you're so distracted by, could be sin, could be you know distractions, the busyness of life, not reading the word, all those things. Then, and, and you ask yourself, how come I don't hear God? How come I don't have clarity in my journey? Well, now you know. Uh, the third point is this, it doesn't mean that God reveals everything at once. And this is something we real, uh, that we see in Paul's life, uh, in his journey. Um, God does reveal some things, but he doesn't reveal everything and he sure as heck doesn't do it all at once. Acts 20, 23 says this, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. So Paul doesn't even, as close as Paul was to God and so um, obedient, Paul himself didn't know what's going to happen exactly or exactly um, how he would go to the next big step. He, God would just remind him or um, tell him of certain things and warn him of certain things, but not everything. Um, but we do have this promise, Matthew 28, 20 B says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so in our lives too, you know, God knows all things and has a purpose and a plan for us, but he doesn't always tell us everything ahead of time. His only promise is that he will be with us. He will empower us and he will guide us. Um, point number four is this, God's path isn't always the one that you would expect to be the easiest or the most logical or reasonable in your mind. Um, we'll look at Acts 20, 21, I'm sorry, Acts 21, 27 through 28. Uh, when the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the crowd and seized him, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law in this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. So to summarize or to give you some context, Paul's finally in Jerusalem of what we were talking about. And so all these people who've been looking to kill him, find him and they're like, hey guys, let's get this guy. The point being, if you're like, dude, if you were Paul and you wanna take this beautiful gospel to Rome, you would think, okay, 
um, in Jerusalem, everybody knows that every, you know, I, that I'm a wanted man. Let's not go to Jerusalem. Let's send somebody else to take the money to the, to needy because it doesn't have to be me. Maybe just write a letter because what's so important about celebrating a quick Jewish ritual holiday that is, that's not even central to my, um, to my, my faith. Why don't I just go to Rome where I won't get killed immediately instead of going into Jerusalem, which is basically a death sentence. Doesn't make any sense. Seems reckless. Doesn't, and I'm, and I'm not saying the Bible encourages us to be reckless, but it seems that way. It doesn't seem smart. But, and we know in, in the previous verses that Paul isn't going to Jerusalem because he wants to. It says the spirit compelled him to. And, and that's what's so important in your life. So one small mini uh, lesson we can learn is before you make any big decisions or any kind of important, small or big, important decision in your life, I want to ask you, are you praying about it? Are you giving God a chance to speak to you? Like take a breath. Is God directing you? And to learn to hear his voice, to channel out the distractions. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the mini point there. Um, so God doesn't always work in the way that we would think that he's supposed to work. Um, but so he's in Jerusalem and guess what? He gets arrested. And uh, guess what? Acts 28, uh, 16, 30 is the other verse that I had for this point, that God's path is not necessarily our path. Acts 28, 16, 30 um, says this, verse 16, when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Verse 30, skipping on ahead, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. And he's able to have like this powerful ministry in Rome. So what happened? First, he's in Jerusalem and then he's, he's, he's imprisoned and then zoom out to, you know, seven chapters later, he's like, hey, I'm in Rome and I've got a house rented. You know, I got a soldier to guard me and people can just come and go as, as, as needed. Like it worked out awesome, right? How did that happen? So that's what happens when we uh, do things God's way. Um, and if you actually read through ver chapters 20 through, the, through 28, we see that Paul um, gets imprisoned in Jerusalem. He gets a chance to speak to Jewish leadership called the Sanhedrin. Then he gets sent off to Governor Felix. Then Felix sends him off to Governor Festus. And then Governor Festus says, yeah, you know what? Don't talk to me. I'm going to send you up to King Agrippa. And then King Agrippa says, uh, okay, well, I've heard you out. I'm going to ship you off to Rome. You can bring your case and appeal up to Caesar. That's what you want to do. And so he just climbs the ladder and he's able to share his testimony to all the greats. And that wasn't a coincidence. It's how God had orchestrated the plan for Paul's life. And Paul trusted God. Um, and we don't know how the story ends in Rome, but we do know this fun fact. Christianity um, was uh, extremely persecuted by Nero in AD 64-ish. There's a great six day fire. I don't know if that date is exact, but there's a six day fire and Nero, uh, Emperor Nero was like, uh, he, was a, he was a sociopath. Um, he would um, crucify Christians. He would use them as human torches and use them to light up his garden parties. He would um, throw them into a den of animals. He would do the whole gladiator thing and, and make them fight and get eaten by lions. He, he, was, he was crazy. And, he hate, and what he did is um, he was an opportunist. The fires happened and he, he's like, I need a scapegoat. He said, let me blame the Christians and start heavily persecuting him. Uh, them because um, they weren't popular to begin with because Christians refused to you know bow down to the emperor and um, they were passionate so the Romans didn't like them so Nero was crazy enough to to do all that but in uh, AD 30 uh, AD 313 um, Emperor Constantine Constantine issued the Edict of Milan and he said Christianity is now an acceptable religion in the Empire in the Roman Empire crazy unprecedented. Um, and then guess what? In uh, AD 380, um, Emperor Theo, uh, Theodosius, uh, he made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. Isn't, isn't that crazy? Like it just boggles my mind. Um, history, by the way, is fascinating. So pay attention in history class. Um, so, you know, the point is sometimes God doesn't lead us or a lot of times God doesn't lead us in a way that we think 
makes the most sense. You know, you might think you, you should be going up to mountain A because it's, t- it's high, it's where you want to go, but you end up seeing that God's leading you up to mountain B and it's a lot lower and it's far away. But who knows, maybe God wants you to go up that mountain so that you have a clearer view in the distance of the mountain that you will be climbing up with his guidance in the way that he wants you to do and the timing that he wants you to do. And you don't realize that until God reveals it to you. But that's, what it re- that's why it requires faith. Um, so again, I want to just close with the, uh, with the reading of Acts 20, 24, our main verse for today. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So our, that, that, is, that is the point. Our, our aim in life and our purpose um, is, is to spread the gospel. And this gets a whole lot easier and maybe, dare I say, exciting when we choose to just trust God. Then, you know, every, then we don't have to question every time something doesn't happen the way we, we want it to or where it seems like God might be leading us to a misstep or a step backwards or a hardship that we could have avoided. Instead, we can take courage and, and focus on finishing the race. Um, so I hope that you understand that your life indeed has meaning and purpose. God does have a promise to be with you and a purpose um, to carry you through. And, and I pray that your purpose in life will be your motivation, especially when things get discouraging and, and inspiration turns to defeat. Um, I pray that God would be your answer in times of uncertainty, in times of suffering. And, and that when things don't go your way, remember that God is in control. He has not left you. Um, and, and, you know, if, if, if you're starting to see clouds and rain and you're not seeing the path anymore, get back into prayer. Get back into surrendering to God. Get back to trusting God. Get back to knowing His Word and work, walking in step with the Spirit so that you know which direction He's compelling you to. And then, you, you know, you have that peace and power back in your life. So that's the word for today. Um, Thank you for tuning in. I hope you have a most blessed week. I'll close this in a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this message that indeed, God, we're not just wandering around meaninglessly. Uh, You've given us a purpose and you are with us through it all. Um, Father, I I know that many of um, our students are young and they might be in a point in their lives where they're kind of searching for meaning of why, what is the point of life? What am I going to do with it? Am I supposed to go to college? You know, lots of questions. Oh Lord, that you would um, give them peace in their hearts, God, that they would realign once again to the greatest calling, the commandment to love you and to love others and, and to rest into that, that they would focus not on knowing all the answers, but knowing you, God from which all the answers that we need to know will follow through from, Father, um, and that they would be blessed with the peace that you give them um, and that you would just be with them in that time. Um, I just pray that over anyone who's watching and and, and, and searching and in need of answers, God. Um, We thank you so much, Lord, and pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right, guys, I hope you have a blessed week. Don't forget to study the word. And if you have any questions, reach out, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.